things. All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Bionic Bug Podcast. You are listening to a special bonus live episode. This is your host, Natasha Bajma, fiction author, futurist, and national security expert. Before we get started, I'd like to thank all veterans for their service. I also want to remind listeners that the views expressed on this podcast belong to the participants and do not represent the official position of the Department of Navy, the National Defense University, the Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. I'd like to introduce my special guest this evening, Samuel Bennett. He's a research analyst with the Center for Naval Analyses International Affairs Group, where he's a member of the Russia Studies Program. He's also affiliated with the American Foreign Policy Council, where he is a fellow in Russia Studies. Today, we're going to be talking about robotics, artificial intelligence, and Russia. Sam, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Why don't you introduce yourself a bit and tell us how you got interested in these fascinating topics? I've been studying emerging technologies for a number of years. So when I joined CNA's Russia program in 2016, we were in the midst of extensive research into emerging Russian military capabilities. And that included military modernization, science uh, and technology achievements, the military industrial complex. And I began to notice uh, that around the year 2013 or, or later and later, I should say, uh, Russian media has been uh, full of interesting uh, announcements, analyses, stories, vignettes, uh, and general data about the emerging Russian unmanned military systems. So UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles, unmanned ground vehicles, the development of unmanned surface and underwater vehicles. And then around 2016 onwards, we're seeing a lot more content and announcements and debates and general data in Russian military discussions about artificial intelligence and what that means for the Russian military and society at large. Excellent. So I read in one of your articles that you talked about the robotization of the Russian military. I'm wondering if you could tell us what you mean by that. So right around 2012, 2013, Russian military has began to codify its approach to the development of unmanned military systems. So the Ministry of Defense, or MOD, has opened several departments uh, in, in, within the institution that specifically dealt with uh, the emergence of unmanned military systems and their acquisition, testing, and evaluation for the Russian military. So we actually have uh, the departments within the MOD dealing with all kinds of robotics. Um, and so Russians are openly debating the importance of robotics to the military forces. They're holding events, they're holding discussions, they're holding symposiums. In fact, one of those symposiums is called just that, Robotization of the Russian Military. Uh, it's been running for two years now. It's going to be an annual event where the government, the military, and the private sector get together and discuss the recent achievements and what that means for the end user. Well, I mean, help me understand why, why is Russia so keen on robots uh, for their military? Well, they're seeing uh, unmanned systems as great mission multipliers. So just like the United States use of UAVs, just like the way Israel and other countries have been using UAVs to, uh, to see farther, to see better, to gather intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, to provide target acquisition, Russians are seeing the emergence of unmanned military systems as a natural evolution of military forces today and in the future. Actually, I read that um, Russian command and control, so their ability to leverage information and communications in the military was kind of behind the times. Is that one of the reasons why they're so interested in robots? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, they're seeing other countries pull away in the design and development and use of various unmanned military vehicles. So they are keen on using unmanned systems, first of all, to save soldiers' lives. And second of all, to be more precise in the way they conduct combat. So for example, Syria has been a major testing ground for Russians in the way they use various military systems. In fact, the MOD stated that over 200 different types of weapons were tested in Syria. And that included extensive use of unmanned aerial vehicles and various tests of unmanned ground vehicles, including unarmed versions. So yes, uh, their command and control, communication, computer, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance capabilities, or what we call C4ISR, is behind that of the United States and some of the more advanced nations, but they're catching up really fast. In fact, in Syria, they were testing a variety of systems that created a major leap in uh, quality of Russian C4ISR and uh, command and control capabilities. 
Would you say that the Russians are ahead of the U.S. and China in terms of testing these robotic cap capabilities in the field because of the, 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 the um, military action in Syria? That uh, tends to be the perception. But the reality is that United States has been using plenty of um, unarmed unmanned ground vehicles for various surveillance and reconnaissance. Uh, United States has been extensively uh, using uh, UAVs, especially combat UAVs, which is something that Russia lacks. China has been developing a lot of UAVs, but it hasn't actually tested them itself. It sold them so that other nations actually use them. Uh, China is developing unmanned ground vehicles as well. So uh, in some ways, United States and China are ahead. In some ways, Russians are actually developing faster capabilities than their nearest peer competitors, such as uh, United States and China. So yes, Russians tested two uh, armored unmanned ground vehicles in Syria, Uran and uh, possibly uh, Saratnik. Uh, but again, the United States has been using UGVs for quite a while. In fact, uh, uh, United States had several thousand smaller UGVs of all kinds in its arsenal. So Russia sees uh, what that means for the modern military. It sees what those capabilities can bring for, this, uh, for the forces. And um, it has been extensively utilizing un, um, uh, unarmored unmanned ground vehicles for demining and unexploded ordnance clearance, which is something that the United States and other nations have been doing as well. But Russians are keen to test all kinds of capabilities, and that includes larger, heavier UGVs armed with cannon, machine guns, and all kinds of other weapons. Um, technology is important for changing the character of war, but so are tactics. Have you seen Russia developing any creative tactics using uh, unmanned systems? Well, they're certainly thinking about how, how unmanned systems can be used. So when it comes to UAVs, they're actually mirroring the success of the United States, Israel, and other advanced nations in utilizing an entire suite of various UAVs from very short range to long range. Uh, they want to have the same capability as the United States in fielding combat UAVs so they can strike targets as soon as they're identified. Uh, they're behind in that. Uh, but they're working on several uh, unmanned combat aerial vehicles or UCAV models that uh, should be fielded either later this year, this year and definitely in 2019, according to all the official announcements. As far as ground vehicles, that's kind of an open book right now. So they're seeing um, how um, some systems are fairly simple and, uh, and could be used uh, uh, readily. Uh, other systems, such as the heavier uh, combat vehicles that... Uh, should remove the operator from combat. That was a lot more uh, difficult for them, and it was a trickier proposition. In fact, they took Uran 9 unmanned ground vehicle to Syria to test it out, and it failed uh, on all major criteria. Uh, one of the most important ones was the failure uh, to place the operator far from combat. So Russians uh, said that an operator could be anywhere from three to five kilometers from combat, in using this UGV, but the modern communications and the communications available to Russians and the environment where they tested it, which was semi-urban, limited that communication to just a few hundred meters. So suddenly you have the operator who is perilously close to combat, uh, which is kind of uh, running against the very nature of designing an unmanned ground vehicle that is supposed to remove the operator. I know it's a kind of a circular mm -hmm. argument, but... Um, so uh, they're using a variety of systems and they're seeing how that could work. Uh, right now, they're saying that uh, until, the, um, until the operational systems for those unmanned ground vehicles could be independent enough so that the vehicle can function on its own, we're talking about limited AI or perhaps machine learning, uh, these UGVs will be used basically in kamikaze roles. So they will be sent against uh, stationary hardpoints where they will essentially run at the enemy, have the enemy fire at them, expose the, themselves so that the Russian manned assets such as tanks, artillery, or air force can finish that. And when it comes to unmanned underwater and surface vehicles, they're also trying to develop their concept of operations. Obviously, most of the U UUVs uh, and USVs in the Russian arsenal are for ISR, against intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, gathering data on surf surface and subsurface environment. So those will probably be operating with uh, surface assets like um, the military and civilian vessels, as well as aircraft, to gather as much data as possible on what happens on the surface and below the surface. So one thing you mentioned, you talked about the, the failure of, I think it was a communication link in an urban environment. Is that correct? 
Yeah. So basically what happened was the operator who was running Aura 9 had a hard time understanding what was happening on the battlefield. So not only did the operator have to be close to the actual UGV, so just several hundred meters or a few thousand feet, um, having action on flat screen monitors wasn't enough for the operator to get a full understanding of what was happening. And this is one of the arguments um, that essentially limit the use of unmanned systems in combat. And that is a manned asset, a soldier, has a quick understanding and a quick uh, review of his or her combat situation. When you have an unmanned ground vehicle in place where a camera has to be in the swivel and you have to kind of uh, gather data, that slows down the uh, conceptualization and understanding of what happens in combat. So those two main issues. So... Um, the inability to remove the operator far from combat and the inability of the operator to fully understand the combat situation were great impediments in further use of unmanned ground vehicles in their present form. So what we have right now in Russian uh, military across their uh, forces is essentially unmanned systems 1.0. So they've built a range of UAVs and they use them successfully in Syria. They build a range of unmanned ground vehicles, both armed and unarmed and they've tested some of them. And they're building a range of unmanned underwater and surface vehicles, but they are getting limited use. So the next iteration will be unmanned systems that can cooperate with each other to operate in swarms, and un uh, unmanned systems that can get a better understanding of combat and perhaps orient on their own a lot more than today. So what you're saying is that Russia is moving towards more autonomous systems to get past the problem that that basically of the communication problems, but also bat battlefield situational awareness problems. Well, that's, that's the wish list. Of course, that will depend a lot on software, on, um, on high-tech components, mm -hmm. something that Russia today is struggling with. So let's talk a little bit about um, autonomy and machine intelligence, um, because often those two are conflated. So I'm yes. curious to hear, how, how do you draw the line between those two topics? Well, Russians are actually... Um, using the terms uh, uh, automated control systems and artificial intelligence and intellectual systems or smart systems interchangeably. So it really, I guess, I mean, I, I suppose it depends on a service that is discussing AI, on specific individuals talking about AI and uh, specific military departments which, which are discussing it, whether you're talking to, uh, whether we are talking about UAV operators or UAV developers or people, for example, who work in air defense uh, uh, and electronic warfare or maybe other services. So they understand that artificial intelligence is the ability of a machine to make decisions on their own, just like a human would, based on a constantly changing set of circumstances. So that difference from machine learning where a limited set of algorithms and data is fed into a system and the operating um, device, whether it's a, a ground vehicle or a UAV, can only operate within the set of algorithms. So artificial intelligence is the end all and the end result and the wish list for the Russian military. But again, getting there would probably be a little choppy considering some of the um, experimentations and results that Russians are getting today. Mm -hmm. So, but let's talk about autonomy a little bit more because it's not the same thing as machine intelligence. And I just, um, it's a big topic in the news these days, autonomous systems, um, but autonomy is not intelligence. And I understand that um, there are differences in policy between the US and Russia particularly, but also China in terms of what they're aiming for with autonomous systems. Do you, do you have views on that? So I can comment on uh, the Russian stands on the lethal autonomous weapon systems debate, or LAWS, L-A-W-S. Uh, when it comes to that, uh, for the last two years, Russians have staked their position as follows. They actually want to have a human in the loop when it comes to lethal autonomous weapon systems. They are not comfortable with releasing the systems to do their own taskings yet. Again, um, the software components, the high-tech components, the mathematical and the operational part of that isn't quite ready. But at the same time, they're saying that an international organization or international treaty or even an agreement between nations should not limit a given nation's ability to manufacture weapons. And so while they agree that a human in the loop is a great idea for autonomous systems, they're currently saying that, look, the autonomous systems under discussion haven't been invented yet. They haven't been built. It's in the realm of science fiction. Mm -hmm. So what kind of discussion could be had about things that are not there yet? 
So for them, it comes down to um, sovereign right of nations to build a variety of weapons. So you're saying the 2.0 systems are not yet possible. So these are the, the, these would be the systems with more autonomy. Correct. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit about autonomy um, for the viewers in terms of what are the benefits of autonomy from a military perspective, and then what are some of the risks, both from a military perspective, but also um, society? Well, I think for the military, if we really boil it down, it means for a given weapon to or, uh, that, that is capable to orient itself correctly in battle, assessing the situation, determining the risks, assessing the threats, targeting the correct type of threats, and then withdrawing once the threats have been neutralized without causing too much collateral damage. And presumably in the best case scenario that is done with as little human soldier involvement as possible. That is what the Russians are saying. They want autonomous military systems to save soldiers' lives and to give military greater precision in combat. But um, again, this, this type of technology is proving elusive, at, at least for now. And so Russians see autonomy much the same way that Americans and Chinese and others see autonomy. So ability of a given type of weapon to orient itself and to make proper calculations under constantly changing uh, set of circumstances in combat, basically cutting through the fog of war with its more precise capabilities. So understanding that it's now science fiction, let's think into the future and let's say that, that uh, autonomous systems are possible. Um, can, can, a com can a country like the U.S. Um, resist autonomy if other countries are going in that direction? Probably not. I think we're engaged in a very um, significant technological race. And just like the uh, United States competed with other nations when it came to uh, ballistic missiles or space capabilities, uh, high-tech and internet capabilities, uh, other ground, air, cyber, space, uh, you know, uh, maritime capabilities, we are now seeing a larger number of nations seeking capabilities with unmanned systems. And right now, again, we are in the unmanned systems 1.0 universe. So these are remote control devices which can operate uh, based on a variety of preset tasks and uh, hopefully take the operator out of combat to a range of about you know, several kilometers in the best case scenario. Um, we have China working on it. We have Russia working on it extensively. Other nations are working on it. And because a lot of the components within those unmanned systems are actually commercial off-the-shelf technologies, which are readily available via internet or uh, even an electronic store, we have even uh, more actors jumping into the unmanned fray. And we're talking about not just states, but non-state actors, whether they be criminal organizations or terrorist organizations. Certainly ISIS comes to mind in their ability to, to um, outfit very uh, cheap uh, Chinese DJI drones with bombs and rockets and cause havoc amongst the Iraqi and allied forces. So the, uh, the asymmetrical advantage enjoyed by ISIS in that regard was absolutely incredible. If we compare the same capabilities five or six years ago when these UEVs were not as readily available. So going forward, we're going to have a lot of nations and non-state actors fielding these capabilities. And it's probably, uh, well, it will probably be difficult to stop that. Yeah, I mean, one thing um, that I've reflected on uh, a lot about drones is that they, for the first time in human history, allow anyone to project power into the air. So even though I can go and buy a $500 drone, I can still put a camera on it, I can put various things on it, I can do surveillance, I can, um, you know, probably right. cause harm to somebody. Right. And that previously, I could not do that from the air as a private citizen. And so what you're saying is essentially, everyone's not only going to be able to project power into the air, but also someday, not too far off, potentially an autonomous air force. Yeah, absolutely. And Russians have encountered that in Syria as well. So in fact, today, they are developing um, tactics, techniques and procedures in dealing with small unmanned aerial systems. In fact, they're pushing the counter UAS or unmanned aerial system training down to practically every uh, military service uh, within the Russian military so that every soldier in uniform should know how to deal with a small UAV. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. So earlier you were saying that um, Russia is also developing undersea unmanned capabilities, um, pri 
primarily for ISR, so I assume that falls under the topic of ocean transparency. What, what are their um, ideas for that capability? Well, uh, historically, uh, Russian Navy, as well as other navies, have had a hard time seeing underwater. So that could be done with various surface-based uh, acoustic systems, uh, aircraft-based systems, uh, maybe submarines. But again, these are manned, expensive assets. So today, it is possible to launch uh, a large number of unmanned underwater vehicles that would be providing basically extra sets of eyes and ears below surface. And that, that is what the Russians are aiming for. The capability that could be launched via their surface ships, submarines, even from aircraft, uh, unmanned underwater vehicles that could dive to various depths from several hundred feet to several kilometers, um, to, um, to UUVs and USVs cooperating together, to unmanned underwater and surface vehicles cooperating with UAVs, ex ess essentially uh, developing this massive ISR net that would be directed from uh, a given military site, whether it be from, from a submarine or a ship or somewhere on shore. Obviously, this affects the stealth advantage of submarines. Very much so. <laughs> and and uh, for since the dawn of the nuclear age, um, submarines have been a very important part of nuclear forces, providing a reliable second strike capability, um, right. uh, the ability to retaliate in the event of a first strike um, nuclear attack. And obviously, if stealth underwater is undermined, um, that calls into question the that, that whole concept of deterrence. Well, I mean, unmanned underwater vehicles can be everywhere at once, not unless you launch several thousand of them um, across the uh, major traffic uh, uh, waterways below and, and, uh, and, and above surface. Uh, but yes, you're right. Um, if, um, if a submarine is located, its, its capabilities greatly diminish. So we're probably going to see the emergence of counter UUV and USV capabilities, just like we saw the natural evolution of counter UAV capabilities emerge soon after UAVs took flight across the world's militaries and non-state actors. I think the good news here is that the counter UUVs capability is probably a little bit easier than counter UAV capabilities. I don't know. What do you think? Well, we have um, you know, a lot of ideas on the drawing boards, a variety of sensors, various acoustic technologies, but it really depends on what kind of unmanned underwater vehicle is fielded, especially at what depth and what the capabilities are. Certainly the smaller, cheaper systems that have to be closer to the surface would be more readily identifiable than, for example, a UUV that dives to the depth of three or four kilometers and stays there, kind of in a very quiet mode, waiting for a submarine to pass. Well, let's talk about some of the creative things that Russia is doing. Um, I read today that they have developed an owl drone. Yes. Um, so R Russians are looking at ways that uh, UAVs could be used in offensive and obviously defensive uh, uh, roles. And so uh, the idea behind a drone, a biomimicry drone that looks just like an owl, or for that matter, a falcon or an eagle, is so that... Uh, this type of UAV can guard uh, various military sites and especially airports so it could chase away birds. That is at least the official explanation behind the development of an owl drone. It has an electric motor, it's very quiet, but at the same time, it may have a very significant offensive capability. If you don't know what you're looking for, you're not looking for it. So if you're scanning the skies for a drone that looks like a drone, you're probably going to ignore uh, a raptor bird, whether it be an eagle or a falcon or an owl. Uh, but if that owl is uh, aimed with uh, a variety of sensors that can scan the ground for adversary military capabilities or signals or soldiers, then you certainly have a very significant mission multiplier. And when you have an owl drone that looks just like any other bird in that part of Eurasia, um, a northern Russia, northern European plain that is home to a variety of uh, predatory birds, again, if you don't know what to look for, you're not going to look for it. It feels very Orwellian to me. Um, it, indeed, and China, didn't China test uh, a flock of UAVs that look just like birds somewhere in their uh, in, in the western uh, regions as well? 
Yeah, I think I might have read that. And um, actually, these small drones that look like animals, insects, um, have been featured in recent films. So there was, um, I think in Miss Sloan, there was a roach, a cockroach drone that ended up, um, spoiler alert, that ended up um, ruining the day uh, for a couple of bad guys who were basically recorded. And then um, in um, Eye in the Sky, which is actually a movie about the use of combat drones, there's a tiny little bird slash insect drone. I can't remember. I, I think it's a beetle. So this, uh, the action takes place in Somalia and Helen Mirren plays a British general. Uh, so this beetle drone has to be operated within a, a close proximity uh, to the operator, actually. So the, the, uh, the British spy, the British Somali spy had to be close to the action. But the beetle j looked just like every other beetle. So it had a short battery life, uh, just a few hours. But in those few hours, it provided very key intelligence. And again, um, if you don't know what to look for, you're not going to look for it. Exactly. Which, which, which brings to mind uh, the common paranoia. If people are going to be afraid of cockroaches, insects, birds, and any other critters thinking that's a drone, what is that going to do to our society? I already don't like cockroaches, so whether they have a camera on them or not. But obviously, I've taken up this theme in my fiction novel, Bionic Bug, <laughs> with swarms of live beetles with cameras on their backs and microelectronics to control their flight. So this has definitely entered my psyche, and um, <laughs> I'm a little concerned about drones that don't look like drones and super small drones and right. you know right. what that all means for privacy surveillance, um, because I could see those owls having many other more uh, malicious functions. So speaking of Russian creativity, um, there's another system that causes me concern, and that is the Poseidon. Can you tell us about the Poseidon? So uh, a couple of years ago, Russians unveiled um, a, a large nuclear-powered unmanned underwater vehicle, which they claim is supposed to be targeting uh, adversary shores. So uh, this type of drone would carry a nuclear warhead that would explode either causing significant damage to shore-based infrastructure or cause a miniature tsunami that can cause extensive damage to the adversary infrastructure, or it can target adversarial ship groupings like the, um, for example, uh, vessels that accompany an aircraft carrier somewhere out in the ocean. And the Russians claim that the nuclear propulsion is close to completion. Uh, they claim that they're starting testing of the Poseidon underwater drone. And this certainly caused um, a lot of heart palpitations across the world militaries. Yeah, I mean, it's unmanned autonomous drone. And I, I read that it, it's supposed to carry a 100 megaton nuclear weapon. Well, I, well, I mean, um, a, lot of, <laughs> a lot of these announcements, you really have to kind of take it with a grain of salt. Uh, you have to wonder whether it's PR or actual capability. And if it's actual capability, why would the Russian military forces give away mm -hmm. those capabilities in public announcements? But yes, potentially it can carry a very large nuclear warhead. I don't know whether 100 megaton is feasible, but again, I'm not, you know, I, I, I haven't, uh, you know, I haven't read anything that would, that would counter that. Uh, one, one thing that we do have to remember is Russians claim that this thing can go fast and it can be quiet. And for a weapon of this kind, uh, you can be either fast or quiet. You probably can be both, Consider considering that it has to travel um, relatively close to the surface and at high speed. So uh, we have acoustic technologies. Our allies have acoustic technologies that can detect a weapon of this kind. So this is something we have to, again, take with a grain of salt when Russians claim that they're fielding something that has super supernatural capabilities like a UUV that runs fast and quiet. Perhaps they're learning from the mistakes made in Dr. Strangelove when the doomsday device wasn't communicated properly? Well, uh, probably. And I, I, it's, it's probably uh, safe to assume that uh, people in the Russian military have watched that movie and, and liked that movie. But uh, it's, it's definitely something that's worth re-watching when you have you know, a couple of hours free. It's a great film and it makes you think. So they do, they, so when I read about it, they consider this kind of a last ditch effort, kind of like yes. a doomsday machine in the sense that, okay, things are really bad. And so this is what right. we're going to do. Um, noting that you can't go fast and be stealthy at the same time. If they choose stealth, which is what I would choose, um, it could potentially be a, not a last ditch effort, so to speak. 
Well, um, it could be a perfect revenge weapon, obviously. If it goes stealthy and slow, it becomes not a secondary strike weapon, but a third strike weapon. Um, and uh, let's hope it never gets fielded. But uh, I think we have to recognize that Russian military, and especially some of its uh, uh, naval industrial complex, d- does still have extensive capability to manufacture weapons that certainly put United States military on notice. Yeah, um, most definitely. So do you have anything else you want to say to us before we close out? Well, um, I think uh, Russian developments in artificial intelligence are worth watching. Their debates and discussions about the use of artificial intelligence in combat merit close attention. The military in, uh, in Russia is taking a very close and hard look at what the artificial intelligence means to them and what it means for the next generation of weapons that they're fielding, especially on manned systems. And Russians are talking a lot about swarms, whether they be in the air, on the ground, or below and above, uh, or uh, yeah, on the surface or below surface. And uh, swarm uh, technologies would have to be guided by a system that will probably approximate uh, artificial intelligence, where swarms will be able to adapt to the changing circumstances, communicate uh, between each unit, and uh, fulfill the mission. So that is definitely something that merits close attention. This conversation has made me think of so many new fiction novels. Um, uh, Tom Clancy-esque, you know, great power novels uh, between Russia and the U.S. again. Um, So you have definitely provided us with a lot of food for thought. Thank you so much for joining the podcast, and uh, we really appreciate your time. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me.